Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Sam Dolce, and I'm an attorney here at Milestone Consulting. I dedicate 100% of my practice to settlement. I grew up in a personal injury law firm, and I've worked as a personal injury attorney. Uh, but now I focus solely on issues of settlement in order to better provide services to your clients and make sure that your hard work pays off by actually helping people's lives. For those who are yet to use GoToWebinar, you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a number of tabs that you can click down and do different things with. Uh, the most important one for today is the Questions tab. Feel free at any point to go over to the Questions tab and give it a then answer or ask anything you'd want. Um, if you type in a question, I can see who the asker is, but you will remain anonymous and I will not share that information. If you have a question about spend downs or anything else over the course of today, please ask it. It's very unlikely that you're the only one who has that question. I'd be happy to provide a detailed answer to you directly via email, or it'll be listed on our frequently asked question sheet. Excuse me. Now, a very brief point on why I think this webinar is so important, and I will try to keep today brief because I know you're very busy. We try to limit these to about 15, 20 minutes and a couple of minutes for questions as well. And so you get a little bit of information and can move on with your day. Uh, but a brief point about why this is so important is that every day I receive calls from your clients who are terrified. I mean, they're really, really scared that they're going to lose their benefits that they and their fam families depend upon. We've all had a client who's already in a tough spot, and our job is to make their situation better. It's more than just winning their case. It's about improving their lives. And that is what we hope to do by engaging in a spend down. This is most important in cases where clients are going to be receiving less than $100,000, which is the vast majority of cases, unfortunately. So even though our goals as attorneys can sometimes get muddled and we're overly focused on maybe trying to win the case, we also want to make sure we're improving lives. And that's why information around settlement is so important. So briefly, I want to talk about benefits. The very first thing to know about benefits is we have to differentiate benefits from entitlements. Entitlements is something that you have a right to. A benefit is need-based. So if you have worked your entire career and you've paid into Social Security disability that entire time, on the very last day, your last day on the job, you get hurt. You will then be able to receive social security disability. It is something you've paid into, and now it will pay back to you. By doing so, that is something you have a right to. Those are funds you have a right to. Different from that situation is Medicaid, for example. Let's say you earn under a certain amount of money, and then you get sick or hurt and you go to the hospital and you get taken care of and they charge it to Medicaid. You're receiving that because your assets are below a certain threshold, your income is below a certain threshold. So therefore, if you get a $20,000 settlement check, that will typically knock you off of any benefits you may receive. So therefore, if your client is receiving benefits and you're sending them a settlement check, you need to know how they can use that money in order to keep their benefits and make the most of their settlement. So what benefits are we protecting primarily? First, Social Security income. Any lump sum payment for Social Security income will count as income in the month received. In the next month, the lump sum will count as an asset. Social Security will look to see if the lump sum received puts your client over the income limits for the month they get both SSI and the lump sum. So what does that really mean? 
let's say that you receive $500 a month in Social Security income, or your client receives $500 a month in Social Security income, and they receive that payment on July 1st. And then July 15th, you send your client a $50,000 settlement check. Since they are over the income guidelines for the month of July, Social Security will send them a notice telling them that they were in fact overpaid for the month of July. And in the future, they will try to collect that $500 back by reducing the future Social Security income payments that they may receive, likely the following month. So if you do not engage in a spend down, you do not provide notice to the Social Security Administration about what you are doing, it's very likely that their Social Security income check will decline in the following month after you send them these funds. That can be very, very concerning to clients who are dependent on this month. The lump sum received will also count against the $2,000 individual or $3,000 couple limit on as an asset test the following month. Social Security looks to see if you're over the asset limit on the first of the month. Therefore, if you send a $50,000 check on the last day of the month, and then it hits their account, it's there that first day, they're very likely to fail that asset test and no longer receive Social Security income. They'll either have to pay that money back through future deductions, or they might even receive a bill. So this is a big issue, as you can see. The next most important benefit is Medicaid. The lump sum, if for Medicaid, the lump sum settlement is considered to be income in the month that the lump sum is received. So as soon as you get the money, then it's seen as income in the month that it's received. There's a very short reporting window to the Department of Health and Human Services. Excuse me. That's only 10 days. The lump sum will never end Medicaid in the month that it is received. So if you have a client who's dependent on their Medicaid and you send them a lump sum on July 2nd, they will still receive Medicaid until the end of July. They will then be off of Medicaid as of August 1st. They do not have to pay anything back for the month of July. In the next month though, anything left over the lump sum counts as an asset. It will then count against the asset limits for Medicaid. So you, therefore, you need to get the lump sum and any other assets that'll push them over the asset limit below the asset limit in the month of the same time that you receive the lump sum. Otherwise, they may be off of Medicaid, have to reapply. It's a whole process. So how do we solve this? We engage in a spend down. To engage in a spend down, one must spend their settlement funds on a specific type of resource in a specific amount of time and report all that necessary information to the Social Security Administration and the Department of Health and Human Services. It's relatively simple. As long as you know how to do it, you can solve your clients through this with relative ease. So they get their check, they have to spend it. But what counts? What can you spend it on? A very common one, I have to say, is a vehicle. You, a lot of our clients don't have cars, they have issues of transportation, they have trouble getting to work, to the grocery store. I mean, a car in American society is almost a necessity, one could argue, unless if you're in a major, major city with wonderful transportation. So and even then, cars can be expensive. So you can use a spend down and pay for your car, including registration insurance for the first year. And that pretty much can take up one giant spend down. If you have a client receiving $20,000, you know they have transportation issues, they have trouble getting from point A to point B, a vehicle is sometimes a wonderful way to use the spend down. Number two on my list is usually education and expenses. If somebody is receiving Medicaid, it's very possible that um, they don't feel fulfilled in their career and they like new training. They can go to trade school, they can get a four year degree, maybe they already have a four year degree, they want to apply to do a master's program, maybe they were in a line of work, they were hurt in a car accident, they can no longer do that, and now they want to be retrained. They can use their settlement funds for education expenses. 
Paying off consumer debt, I don't know anyone who doesn't have a little bit of credit card debt that they would like to pay down. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful option. A lot of the times, the really sophisticated attorneys who know that their client won't be receiving more than $100,000 and they know that they're in a lot of debt will suggest that they go to debt consolidation firms and so that they can package their debt into one piece. And then after that, once the settlement check comes in, they can pay it off in one go. Um, that's a really smart way of doing things. Let's say it's a case that's taken a year or two. I strongly, strongly recommend that. Prepaying burial arrangements. A little morbid, I know. Um, however, it is something you'll be surprised about how your clients respond to. Um, many elderly clients are very concerned about leaving their families in a position of debt. And burial arrangements are very expensive, especially nowadays. Uh, buying a burial plot can be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so this is a really good way of being able to spend a large amount of money in a very quick amount of time and on something that you know that they're eventually going to need. Um, it can be a wonderful use of the funds. Home purchase and modifications. Um, this is one that if you're sophisticated and you've been doing this a while, it can be wonderful to get somebody into their first home as a homeowner. It also can backfire. Um, so you have to be very, very careful when dealing with home purchases. Uh, if you were attempting to do this, I would recommend you call me. Um, however, the biggest issue here is going to be timing. A home purchase, obviously, if it's going to be a cash purchase, is a little bit quicker. But if there's going to be a mortgage involved and you have to do a title search and you know all the things that go into a home purchase, it can take months. And therefore, you'd want your client to get started in the process as soon as possible before settlement funds even arrive. The, the terrible situation that can happen is there's a home purchase, the closing date keeps getting pushed back, the funds are in their account, they're kicked off all their benefits and they can no longer afford to buy the house because they're in all sorts of other debt. Um, that's something that we hope to avoid. Um, home modifications are a little bit easier. A lot of our clients have issues with accessibility after their injury and you can modify your home in order to improve that. Um, so that is really a wonderful option. Um, other types of things that you can include are furniture, clothing, entertainment and recreation expenses. Um, I don't always mention these uh, when I'm consulting with clients. Um, sometimes it confuses people. They're typically smaller budget items, so you have to keep more receipts when reporting. Um, but generally, it can be a wonderful, wonderful thing if someone really needs a new bed because of their accessibility issues or something of that sort, you can include those types of things. Medical expenses are usually the number one thing people use their spend down for. Um, you, can, <coughs> you can pay off um, your clients or their spouses medical, medical bills and unpaid medical debt up to six years in the past. Um, so that is a wonderful option. A lot of people have a great deal of medical debt. Again, you can work with a debt consolidation firm. It's a great option. Part of any medical bill or Medicare and Medicaid does not cover. So a lot of times this would include co-pays or things of the like. Uh, medical expenses outside of Medicaid coverage, maybe there's a home care health aid they've been assigned, but it won't be covered by Medicaid or Medicare, you can pay for that through a spend down, any kind of therapy, uh, drug and alcohol programs are actually really popular use of this, um, personal care attendance. Um, and then another really important one is prescription drug bills. Uh, those can be extremely, extremely high. So it's important to reference those. Um, as a side note, just keep your clients out of debt. We know how interest rates in many states can get quite high. Uh, I'm based out of New York State. We have usury laws, but there seems to be different types of debt that slowly find their way out of those. So um, keeping your clients out of debt is a wonderful use of their spend down. There are two other options, um, pooled special needs trust or a small traditional structure. Uh, we'll cover those in other webinars. 
Um, but the general idea between a pooled special needs trust is <clears throat> it is a number of individuals' funds uh, that work together as a special needs trust for those individuals. It is uh, operated by a nonprofit entity and they're available in every state. A small traditional structure is an annuity that will pay out a couple hundred bucks per month, hopefully keep you below those asset and income tests and uh, allow people to access their funds. So time for questions. Um, looks like we have three or four, so I will get into those right now. Just give me a moment. So the first question is, are there differences in what counts for Social Security income versus Medicaid? And do you have a citation where we can find this list for Social Security income? Um, there are some slight differences in the lists. Um, however, they're very similar and everything I covered today is on both. Um, I will provide that citation uh, for both lists via email out to everybody. It is part of the informational PDF uh, that we'll just send along to everyone's emails so that you have that as a reference. Um, I recommend you just opening a little folder on your desktop for settlement and uh, we can drag all your our informational things into there. We do FAQs, we do fact sheets, so and I'll provide all the sites in that as well. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, how do qualified settlement funds relate to a spend down? So uh, qualified settlement funds um, are uh, settlement accounts outside of a firm's escrow account. Um, so if you are addressing the payee in your settlement agreement, you can send it to a qualified settlement fund instead of to your firm's escrow account. Um, and from there, uh, the funds are not registered or they're not constructively received by either the firm or the client. Um, for that purpose, if they're not received by either the firm or the client, um, that's a wonderful use of a qualified settlement fund. This works really great for home purchases. So if your firm has a firm-wide QSF, you can put the money in the qualified settlement fund. Your client can go forward, figure out their home, and the day of the closing day, they can transfer the funds from the QSF into their account, and therefore there's gonna be no issues of their funds. Textbooks, are they covered in educational expenses? Generally, yes. Uh, they have to be relevant to the classes they're taking, but Jen, I've never heard that not working. Excuse me. Travel as recreation, yes, uh, travel is typically included as a recreation expense during a spend down and is allowable. So if you have a client who may not have a lot of time left in their life and they've always wanted to take a dream trip to, you know, maybe their native land or somewhere else, they're welcome to do that. Medical debt of extended family members. So, you are allowed to use your funds from your settlement to pay off the debt of you and your spouse, but not of extended family members. That would exclude cousins, uncles, nephews, and the like. Oh, and there's a clarification, another question. Also, just to clarify, if a client is receiving Social Security income, they spend down for their month, does it still count as income and count against benefits that are recovered the following month? So if you properly engage in a spend down, it is not seen as income in the month it is received and will not fail the asset test in the following month. Therefore, you're able to preserve all of the client's benefits. I hope that answered that in full. Okay, um, we're coming to an end of questions. That was a quick six. If there are any more questions, please, please email them in. I will provide those citations uh, to everybody as well in the informational fact sheet. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, we stuck to our 20 minutes and uh, I'm proud of that. We try to make these quick over people's lunch breaks or roundabout just so um, we can give you some information really quickly. Uh, thanks for joining me today. If you have any other questions about settlement, we're happy to answer them, whether it be 
QSFs, attorney fee deferrals, traditional structures, equity back structures, really anything. Um, we're happy to answer those as well. So thank you for your time and uh, I'll be ending the webinar. Thanks again.